Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of NBS. Today, we have a few of our lore masters from the newest RP setting in the North Pacific, that of Saurus. Our guests today are Pardinia. Hello. Hey, Ark. Howdy. Steve. Hello. And Andy. Hello. You know, it's not very often that TNP gets a very new RP setting with a fresh and blank slate, but uh, that's really what Saurus is. So, actually, what's interesting is I'd like to turn it over mostly to Ark to talk about sort of the conceptualized story of Saurus, what it's about, and what it affords RPers the opportunity to do. Uh, so, Saurus is the, you know, as you said, the new uh, forum RP fantasy setting. Uh, the... It, the the idea for it started around like two years ago, and it's been in the works uh, since. Uh, we had uh, quite a few people uh, help uh, make it possible. Uh, Steve, Andy, and Pry, who are all here. Uh, we have Laws, Tim, Bork as well, and huge uh, special thanks uh, to Kyle in particular because he made the amazing map. Uh, I would say that the big, the big, the big seller with Source, um, it's uh, really meant to be there for fantasy RP as well as just being a creative freedom outlet. As was like the original guiding principle. It's it's true north. You could say it's been it's been it's been in the works for a while, and I'm really glad that we could finally make it happen. Yeah, over two years in the making. Do I have that correct? Uh, yeah, uh, I, the idea was originally formulated around the same time, uh, another setting Imperium Galactica launched, but, uh, it didn't actually start getting worked on until a little bit after Imperium Galactica kicked off. Yeah. I mean, with everyone that we have here, you've all had different, uh, hands in, you know, creating this and successfully launching at different parts to play in a way. Um, if you, if you guys were able to like divide that, you know, two year timeline into like stages of what it takes to really launch a new RP setting, what would that kind of roadmap look like from the conceptual idea to like where we are today with people signing up and joining? Well, if, if I may, uh, pop in here, um, hello, uh, this is, uh, Pridania, uh, lead RP mod over in here in TNP, uh, basically the, the, the process that happened was that uh, Imperium Galactica, which is one of our two sci-fi forum-based settings, uh, was launched by Esp, who was one of our RP mods. And uh, that got a very good reception. And Art uh, saw what Esp had done and came to me and said, hey, could we do like a fantasy setting we we and we and that was something that we didn't have we had had a previous fantasy setting that didn't quite work out for a variety of reasons uh and it had sort of and it had never been replaced and arc said hey i would like to do a fantasy setting and i said well okay um do you like what do you have in terms of an idea of how you want it to work and he had a very uh, he had a very broad outline, so I brought some other mods. I, uh, one mod, uh, Laws, I brought on. I think he was the first person, and Ark and Laws world built some ideas, and as it grew from there, we just started adding more people. Uh, we added um, Andy, who is someone who has a, a keen interest in fantasy uh, literature and fantasy RP. We brought in Steve, who had, who, all, who was a huge to, uh, Tolkien fan, and then, of course, we had people like Burke and S, who, of Imperium Galactica fame, who came in. And it was really a, a case of, in terms of the, um, the stages of development, it's really just a case of going piece by piece and figuring out what you need. Um, the first step is what kind of setting and that was fairly obvious it was going to be fantasy but you know how does that work um obviously we're gonna have magic do we want gunpowder to what extent do we want gunpowder to what extent do we want magic um 
to how powerful do we want magic to be? And then, you know, we just kind of ferned off other discussions that as these discussions grew, we figured out we needed some more perspectives and we looked at our roster of our peers and said, okay, well then who should we bring in to discuss this? And we brought them in. Um, and everybody, even those who aren't with us right now, who were, um, involved in making Saurus, you know, played a very important role, but it's really, it, it's less so a single roadmap of these are the things that you've got to hit to launch a setting and more a collaborative process of basically banging ideas together until you've come to uh, a realization of what you want things to be. And then uh, moving on to the next thing, essentially. And um, yeah, it took two years to get going. But uh, I'd actually say that's not too terribly bad. Um, Imperium Galactica, which was the setting that launched that um, inspired Saurus, um, a lot of people don't realize it because F, F kind of presented it um, full cloth. Um, but he, uh, you know, had been working on that for close to a year you know, by himself. So to really get a setting going, it does take a while. It takes a while to work out the, the story of the setting, what kind of setting it's going to be, what the tech levels are going to be, what the restraints are going to be on the players, uh, how much freedom versus control we want to give slash exert. So all of this stuff had to be discussed. And... um yeah, like I said, it was far less of a coherent uh, list of things that had to be checked off and more just kind of banging the ideas against each other until we got something that we were happy with. Sounds about uh, like most other things in RP. I mean, it's a collaborative exercise between people. And I really think yeah. I really think that's what's great about um, just a new RP setting to begin with is like the opportunity of it. It's a very blank slate that people can come together and do something a bit different with because... Unlike other settings like Ares and Strange Real that have been around for quite a while now, it's more the way I see it as someone who's recently joined Soros and actually just recently got back into RP, is that it's it's a it's a very unique opportunity to just like get in on kind of the ground floor of things in a way, to where you don't not that this is necessarily a bad thing, but there's not a whole bunch of um, like already established conventions for you to have to grasp. You can kind of work with your fellow RPers to develop that. And yeah, like you were saying, you know, having a new setting brings up new questions. I know just from being around in the channels, some of the other questions we've had is, you know, to what extent can certain creatures do certain things, certain species? You know, dragons is one of them. Like, you can't, you, obviously, you know, there's certain restrictions placed to avoid things like god modding and stuff like that. The, the, the general attitude that I think and, and the two general attitudes that I, I, I think were important were, one, we want people to be able to um, get what it says on the tin, which is, you know, Soros is TNP's forum-based fantasy setting. So people want to RP in that, you know, they are going to see forum-based you know, we're going to see fantasy RP setting and we want them to be able to do fantasy RP things. We want them to be able to do orcs and elves and dwarves and all that stuff if that's what they want to do. And dragons are kind of part of that. Dragons are ubiquitous in fantasy literature. And so, you know, um, I, you know, we just using dragons as an example, we can't, I don't think it would have been right to ban dragons because people want to do dragons. People see fantasy, they want to do dragons. But we also need to make sure that, you know, people don't god mod and just say, like, I have an army of a billion dragons that I take over everything because, like, fuck, that, that's not fun for anyone. So they are the all-destructive air force, and obviously they're just going to be raining flames down on people. Uh, and, and so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good idea just to have a, a rule that's just, like, don't be a dink. Like, like, you can have freedom to do pretty much whatever you want, but if you start being, like, a, a dink, then, then we're going to come down on you and tell you can't do that. But other than that, yeah, you know, you can have freedom to do what you'd like to do. It's 
It's actually interesting you brought up the species because when I was looking through our old um, group chat, because initially we planned this in a group chat, uh, I was looking through that, and one of our old pins in there is actually a concept I had at that time that I'm very glad we went against, which was that there was a set list of species. There was a set list of humans, orcs, dwarves, elves, and then anything else you had to submit to us. And I'm really glad we went against that, and we didn't do that because that's a horrible idea, and I don't know why I came up with it. It would make a lot more sense if you were a very structured setting, if it was, you know, maybe something like D&D, but um, the way Source works, I think the way we went, where you have creative freedom to do basically whatever species you want, I think that's a far better direction. Yeah, because even in the umbrella term of elves, for example, like some people have snow elves, some people have high elves, some people have dark elves. Like it, there's all these different kind of, um, I don't know if, the dom if denominations is the right word, but there's these different, you know, there's differences in one species group. Like it's not like just, okay, we have elves and that's it. Um, and, you know, I think that's really kind of a testament to sort of the flexibility and freedom that Taurus allows. Like Pry was saying, uh, and like Ark was saying, the Tolkien influence there. I wonder if Steve could maybe speak on that more, just about uh, being a huge Tolkien fan himself. Um, how Soros kind of either emulates that or pays homage to that. So, um, one thing I'm really happy that we did um, through a process of developing this is there was a evolution on how the lore masters saw how we wanted the setting to be um, addressed, not addressed, um, carried out. Uh, I was an opponent early on, and I'm pretty sure Fry and S also were, of allowing there to be um, a lot of creative freedom in that you could make these characters that could fit specific roles. I remember um, we were talking about characters that would be considered godlike or some of that, or something along those levels, because I was doing to RPA um, Dark Lord or a malevolent being that. Wanted, I wanted to use them as a story piece more than an actual character to allow others to, um, you know, have an antagonist for their stories. And initially, we kind of stopped. Did We didn't um, go with C. We initially were saying, no, there has to be a power level. We don't want to allow god moding. But I'm very happy the lore masters have kind of pulled back away from that um, when it comes to uh, deciding what uh, we're going to allow and whatnot. And... Um, I mean, your question, sorry, I kind of got off on my own track there, but your question about Tolkien's influences, I know with what I have world built, I took a lot of um, Tolkien's influences when it came to what I was designing. I, um, my initial world building focused around um, religion. I didn't go with the language stuff like Tolkien did because I'm not a linguist, but um, I started off with religion. I looked back at early Christian and uh, Mesopotamian religion and decided how to mix those together into something and built out from there. And I think a lot of people, when it comes to their world building, when it comes to de designing the setting, have gone deep into world building and looked into a lot of different real wild examples and built around there. And it's created a very vibrant and rich world building situation where people aren't sticking to the very shallow levels of fantasy. Like you see a lot of the times people do elves and elves will be a, st they're a, a stereotype across fantasy because they were made by Tolkien a specific way or the orcs a specific way because Tolkien made them like that. What I'm noticing is people are taking these archetypes and bending them a little bit. Like Andy's doing a, fanta a fantastic job with elves and so is Tim um, to change elves away from their typical high nose stereotype into something different and unique, which I, I think is wonderful. I really appreciate that Alan and Steve. Um, I've had a fantastic time developing the snow elves. They have themselves kind of been a work in progress for about as long as Soros has, well, as long as I've been in the Soros project, basically. I think from day one, I was thinking elves. Um, I don't want to get too off track I'm, uh, from the initial question, but my influences largely came from uh, the Elder Scrolls, actually. I'm a huge fan of the Elder Scrolls. Um, the Dark Elves in specific, you can see a lot of their influence in the snow elves. And um, also a lot of influence from a game you wouldn't expect, which is Ultra Kill, like another game that I really, really like. It's got a lot of stuff with angels and all that. And early Christianity was another really big influence. But um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate your comment about my elves. 
No, and I think that I I just think that we've all done a fantastic amount of world building. I mean, Pry Ark and I, um, we very 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 early on have developed a um, three uh, civilizations that are uniquely intertwined. Pry and I remember the night that we came up with this idea. We were joking about um, our favorite animes, him his being Dragon Balls, and mine being JoJo's. And I know I might get flack for that, but so what? Um, I was gonna do. I was gonna do the vampires from there because he was doing the Saiyans from uh, Dragon Ball. That's that's, and, that's actually a funny story in and of itself. I was originally not gonna be involved with this beyond my, um, beyond my my uh, whatever I needed to do as head RP mod just to oversee it and see that it launched uh, uh, successfully. Uh, because like, okay. Um, I'm a big fan of fantasy literature, um, but I have worked in themes from two of my favorite fantasy works, those being Beowulf and then um, the King Arthur mythos. I've worked both, I've worked elements both of those into my, into Pridadia and Eris. And so, you know, I kind of looked at like the, a, a fantasy setting. I was like, well, I'm not sure what I'd even do here. Uh, I, so it's like, well, you know, Ark wants to do it. We've got some talented people who are working on it. So I'll just be, uh, I'll just be here in the background as support. And then when they need to launch it, I'll, you know, play that role. But um, I didn't have any ideas for what I was going to do it, do it. And then I kind of had like, and then like through, you know, this discussion, Steve and I had, I had this, like idea this like idea it's like i'm gonna do like saiyans from dragon ball but in a fantasy setting and it was so supremely stupid but it worked out very very well and i'm very glad that we ended up doing that, going in that direction i remember i remember um when i came when Pry and i were having this initial conversation i was picturing um because i initially came on the idea of doing um vampire counts like from warhammer fantasy I uh, I have too much of a love for Tolkien, and I like role playing evil things too much. So I immediately shifted towards a more of a Mordor theme. But I wanted to get away from Mordor entirely. I I mean I'm not good with coming up with names. So my main villain's name is Salroth, and that obviously sounds like Sauron. But I'm bad with names, so let's just move past that point. But um, I remember Pry and I were having this discussion, and I was just imagining. Um, a dark lord and a Saiyan having a anime style battle where they're uh, yelling out their moves before they did. And I think Fry and I had that discussion. I don't think we've ever implemented it, but I remember having that discussion with him and it was like 2 a.m. by that point. So I was going a little delirious from lack of sleep. <laughs> I, I, I remember it was, it, was, it, it was really enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. And it, and, it, and just kind of building off of that, we then talked with Ark and we worked out this like basically so arc arc station well arc station the 13 realms uh you've got um steve's um sour off character you've got my uh i call them archians but they're basically just fantasy saiyans and they're all kind of intertwined in one story right now which is um the girl and the sun so uh go check that out uh <laughs> yeah it's a bit of a shameless plug there but it's, it's a good one nonetheless yeah but yeah, but um, it's just a good example of like we have no real like like this is all very new. There really was no centralized lore. There really were no established conventions in the world yet, and so we kind of just launched it. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been pretty good we were able to build a sort of three-way story uh kind of four-way if you include mj's the uh um martivar in there which yeah the martivir well he really was never uh mj kind of got pulled into this just by proxy but um he's playing along with it so he's been a good sport about been a good sport yeah (laughs) and just and just going back a bit it's like was gonna stay in the background wasn't really gonna be involved proceeds to be the cartographer for sir so Uh so so basically that was because and uh i i see that he's here in in the audience hello kyle um kyle uh made us a fantastic map um, but you know, he tells me like, I've got, you know, I've got a lot of stuff coming up IRL. I'm going to be really busy. I won't be able to maintain the map. And that was, uh, that was kind of, uh, a, a bit of a, oh no situation because 
if you look at the Thoros map, it is a uh, complex piece of work. Uh, and so I basically, I had to, I, 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 I stepped up. I was like, okay, um, give me the map and I will do it. And so, yeah, I've gone from being like, I will not be involved beyond what is necessary to like suddenly, okay, no, now I am involved and I'm collaborating with two and three other people to now I'm doing all that. Plus I'm the cartographer. So I got pulled for, I got pulled deeper and deeper into this as this went on. We would, uh, we would of course be remiss if we did not mention that without Kyle's efforts on the map in particular, there is no source. Like the map That's that people are able to like make claims on and just get involved with the setting on Kyle, a hundred percent there. Um, and obviously that is yeah. handed off to Pry for the, you know, week to week cartography handling of it, which is obviously a vital function, but just like the setting itself, like the visualization of how do these, uh, different, you know, nations or different civilizations sort of relate to one another on a physical, like land mass. There you go. The sort of thing. I mean, map are very uh, uh i i mean it's gonna sound crazy because they're pretty much essential to every rp setting ever um but i am gonna say it uh maps are very underrated and uh me uh giving kyle a shout out again um in a uh in in another rp setting in eris the the main modern tech forum setting um i've got a you know, when I was writing uh, for the King of Valhalla in Eris, um, as I kind of created these these towns across Prydania as I needed them, as the story dictated. And um, I kind of had like a vague idea of where everything was, um, but it was all just kind of in my head and map making has never really been my forte. Um, Kyle went ahead and made me a map of Prydania. And um, when I when it was done, when I just had it and I was able to look at this map and see, you know, the location of all these towns or all these events that I had written and taken place. It was like really cool. It was a, a, a insanely cool. Oh yeah. I've and, seen that map and it's quite cool. Yeah. And, 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 and but, but to, to, to roll it all back to Soros, like to have a map of this quality, um, is absolutely amazing. And, uh, like, it's right down to, you know, you look at all of these rivers, you look at all the rivers on Saurus, right? And it's like, okay, Kyle made each and every one of those by hand. So that is uh, just a level of his dedication that made it all possible. And it's just, and it, and it, and it is awesome because like we mentioned, like I mentioned, um, uh, Steve, Ark, and myself kind of have this three-way story going on. And MJ kind of got pulled into it. Well, he kind of got pulled into it because he claimed the space in between my my plot of land and uh, Ark's plot of land. And kind of just by necessity, he got pulled into it. And uh, he's been a good sport about it. But at the same time, that's sort of how the actual physical map of an RP setting can impact things is that, you know, you, you you get pulled into things that your neighbors are doing that maybe you wouldn't have been involved in before, but you are now, and that ends up being a good thing. So uh, the map is hugely important. Dialogue think- between other RPRs ends up becoming like opportunities for people to get involved and tell different stories that they may not have like came up with on their own. You know? Oh yeah. Sorry, who uh, to whoever I uh, get off there. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. I I was saying I think sources map is especially important as a fantasy setting, um, because if you've ever looked at the source map, it has actual geography on it. It's not just a flat map, um, and especially for the medieval tech setting, geography is hugely important for world building. It determines what kind of you know species you might want to have. It determines ge- like actual borders. It determines a lot of things. It's really important. And um, also going back to that thing where you know someone claimed between where where MJ claimed between um, Ark and Pride, uh, another Ark here, Yalk, who was a lovely person, uh, claimed between me and Ark. Um, and I had sort of had this idea in the past, and Ark was on board of it, where they. The area of Cindersill and the Thirteen Realms, 
um, was once controlled by a sort of dragon cult empire thing. Um, and Yolk's been a fantastic sport and was very open to being part of that history. And so is uh, Est, who is also sort of in that region as Kurabesh. Um, so yeah, I, I think this map is especially important for uh, the setting. And we would not have swords without this map. Uh, oh, and uh, I, it's an absolute... It's an absolute work of art as well. Like Kyle did an amazing job with it. Wow, chef's kiss right there. Yeah, this is the part of the broadcast where we put over Kyle, but like seriously, um, <laughs> there, there is no, like it, instead of, okay, here is, here's the borders of how a continent looks. Like there, there are rivers that was mentioned. There are mountains and all of this, all this hand drawn. And I think that as if, if I'm not mistaken, hand drawn. And I think that's one of the unique things you get with Soros, in addition to like the imagination and creativity aspect of it. You get a lot of like passionate, talented people just like putting in their pieces as they get involved. And it kind of, you know, even it happens in any RP setting, but especially in one as new and as sort of free flowing as this, you get people who can just kind of project their passions onto what they're doing and kind of set up other people's um, ability to create what they want, you know, because it gives you that foundation. So, oh, so I had I don't know. You got, you got. So the map actually um, really influenced how I pictured what I was um, world building. So, you know, every, every, every evil villain needs his lair, right? So I didn't know if I was going to do the typical fortress, tower, or what. Eventually, I decided I saw this big mountain on this peninsula that unfortunately Andy and I both claimed, but I got that claim in first. Sorry, buddy. It's uh, <laughs> But But uh, I, I saw that and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a uh, something much like they did in the Selmarillion, if anybody's ever read that, where Morgoth has her... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Talk to me about the Lord. Talk to me about um, Tolkien and Star Wars. I could talk your ear off for an hour. But, um... Uh, so I decided that I was going to do the same thing. Like, not the same thing, but it's a similar thing to what Morgoth was doing with, like, the fortress built into the mountain. And that wasn't something I was planning on doing, but, you know, the just how... I just saw that plot in the map and I decided, you know, that looks pretty good. That looks perfect. And then, uh, then Ark even, um, uh, being across the bay from, well, not bay or whatever you want to call it, the sea from where I am, he named that little piece of ocean right there, the Sea of Shadows. Like it just allowed the map built, the map made world building so much more vivid, at least in my point, from my point of view, that I think that um, it really like, I don't want to. I don't want to seem like we're gassing up Kyle too much, but it really, it really did change and make things a lot better for world building. Um, that we had that. It, it's actually kind of a funny story about how you and Andy both wanted that that mountain area because um, when I got the map from Kyle and I began experimenting with it to figure out how I was going to do claims on it. I, I had finally settled on that. I figured it out, and I, and I was like, okay, like, we are good to launch. How do we want to do this map situation? And uh, Art, who was, you know, the, the head of the setting, said, Pry, why don't you put your claim on first? And that will give people an idea of, you know, general size of, of claims and, and what they should be doing, that kind of thing. Problem was that the backstory that I had worked out with Steve was that my people, the Archeans, following, you know, the traditional Saiyan Dragon Ball story, you know, were actually under the sway of Sauroth, the Stark Lord. So I was like, well, I can't really put my guys down on the map first. I need to know where Steve's putting his people, and then I'll put my people next to him. And... So I went to Steve and I was like, uh, all right, man, like, here you go. The way the circumstance worked out, you get first dibs. Like, where do you want it? And uh, he happened to pick a piece of land that Andy was also considering. And I felt very bad about that because it was not, it was not exactly the most transparent process. I was mildly upset at the time, but I... It doesn't really bother me because I actually really love my current claim. It's 
Perfect. Awesome. And, and then even better, I was in Italy on an archaeological dig when Pry sent me that. So I had just gotten back from a day of digging. I've been in a hot Italian sun for seven hours that day. And I finally see the DM from Pry like, hey, where do you want it? And I was like, here, right. I took a screenshot of it on the map. I was like, right there. And then, sure, sure as shit, as soon as I look in the uh, Lore Masters chat, I see Andy um, post where he wants it. I'm just like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's like, you know, it's like in, um, what, which Avengers movie was that where Thanos looks at her and goes, I'm so sorry, little one. And oh, God. Anymore. Yeah, and throughout this broadcast, we've been mentioning the Lore Masters, this, the Lore Masters that I think it's important just like for contextual pur- purposes. Um, for some of our listeners who might not understand what the Lore Masters are, it's essentially the equivalent of like an Eris Conclave where you have people who are in, ch- in charge of making sure the setting runs smoothly, like in character making sure that, you know, somebody doesn't come up with something absolutely outlandish that just makes everyone else's experience worse. They're kind of there to help, you know, keep the setting, um, I don't want to say clean, but like it's, keep the setting orderly, like functional. It's a bit like a little mini RP mod kind of role. Yeah, exactly. That, that is who the Lore Masters are. And actually all of our guests here today are part of that Lore Masters team. Uh, there are, I think we mentioned in the beginning, there are quite a few more who, uh, unfortunately, aren't with us today um i think i don't know if i should shout them out again because i think we shouted them out at the beginning um if law is the uh poor mark ass laws bork laws bork ass tammy uh tim uh that's it actually oh yeah let's go i don't know the lore master but uh oh, well they're in the ma- they're in the old lore master chat. I don't know if they have the lore master role. No, Kyle has his own role. Uh, Kyle the source. Um, oh, <laughs> so much love in the RP community. Like we're just shouting out everyone. But yeah, yeah. That was, but, not, but yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I was gonna say not a lore master, but it made me think of this earlier when Steve was mentioning how he focused on religion as opposed to linguist uh, linguistics. Do you know who does focus on linguistics in Taurus? Uh, uh, we have a, yeah. Sodium. Yeah, we have our own linguistic student in, in, in for us. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's got yeah. some really interesting stuff going on with his, uh, kobolds and his kobold language. Um, he's actually, uh, lovely. Oh, and dark. And dark. And dark. Uh, yeah. and sodium. We got him. We got him. We got him. Dark. Shot at dark. Dark. Uh, oh, uh, in the lore match chat. I actually. Dark. Dark. dark yeah. yeah and, uh, Dark briefly slipped my mind there for a moment because he came on after we launched the setting. Uh, but yes, Dark is a lore master and um, he is our resident uh, make things worse for people if they decide to be a problem. So, a <laughs> <laughs> hammer lock behind glass just in case it's emergency. <laughs> Don't you have a don't you have sort of a linguistics thing going on too, Andy? I think I saw you post about. Yeah, I do. Um, as I have been working on the Snow Elves for a long time, I've also been working on their language for a long time, and I still don't have much progress on it. But they've got a writing system. Um, it is called Selic because they are the people are the Selamer, which means kin of the North or Northerly kin or something along those lines. Um. I've been working on it for quite a long time. I did most of it in between classes in the past couple semesters. Uh, it's really fun because it's not based on any Earth language. Well, it does have some influence for some Celtic and Scandinavian languages, but it's very minor. Um, it's been very fun to do linguistics. Yeah, and uh, people get their fun from doing linguist- linguistics, and then there's just me over here thinking, like, oh, wow, that sounds like quite the tall task. And then there's Sodium. He already, you know, is just keep pushing ahead, plowing along on that front. People, I mean, that's one of the great things I think about our RP community. It's not just limited to Saurus, is that, <laughs> ah, sorry, everyone sort of has their areas of interest and their areas of uh, speciality and... It really makes things uh, great because everyone kind of emphasizes a different part about world building or RP, and you get to see what they really love come to fruition. Uh, And then because of that, you know, often there's a lot of cross-pollinization. People will go, well, you know, uh, 
I'm not really big into languages, so maybe sodium's going to help them with their languages. Um, I know for a fact that uh, one of my, one of the things that I'm really great at, graphic design, I've helped a lot of people with their coats of arms and flags and whatnot. <laughs> and so, and so like, you know, everyone sort of brings something to the table. Everyone has their, their area of interest and it just really, uh, it really comes to life in a great way. So, you know, that's always a big plus and sodium. Yeah. He's our, uh, he's our, our main linguistics guy. But then as you said, like Andy has also been, uh, working in those waters too. So we definitely, definitely benefit a lot from having this wide variety of interests. Uh, I also, I think Ark has very recently started doing linguistic stuff as well. Um, in the past, like, week. Uh, yeah, uh, Ogwen, uh, Ogwen, which is a conlang, my very first conlang project, actually, that is supposed to be for the 13 realms to speak. But I, I genuinely don't have any idea what I'm doing, which is why I went to Sodium for advice. His advice has been very good, but, uh, there was, there was a, there was a little spat not really spat, but I guess uh, I apparently put the consonants in the wrong pot spots in the chart. So he kind of grilled me for that, which, you know, beginner's mistake, I guess. And like, one thing I also really enjoy about this is as, as somebody who, um, I got my degree in classical history, um, being able to do a setting more towards that time period has been really cool. Like, I know it's fantasy and everything, but like, um, even on eras, Pry and I have recently um, been trying to work a uh, ancient war that's well been lost to myth into um, into uh, the setting. So I mean, this has just been really fun for me to be able to go to a time period that I have um, been w more focused on through my studies, through um, my first degree and now my second degree. Uh, and you know, I think that's interesting too because of the specific time period that Soros is generally based off, which is the late 15th century, is actually really underrepresented in Eris. There's very little world building for that period that I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure it's out there, but it's certainly not a super common thing to world build. So it's really interesting to take a break from a modern setting or from a side by setting, which I'm also very active in. It's very interesting to take uh, a break from that and go to something much lower tech and a period of history that on earth i'd really really enjoy well yeah and it's uh one thing i think is you know when you picture what soros would look like it's um you gotta remember the events that happened in the 15th century on the united the americas were discovered uh by the uh, rediscovered i would say by europeans or everybody in the world um the the roman empire got its final death blow and by the ottomans i mean this was an era of incredible change going away from you know, pikes and swords and shields being the primary way of fighting to gunpowder and cannons. I mean, it took a few centuries a little more, but this is uh, the 15th century is an immense period of change. And I think that's fun to be able to represent in a fantasy time where um, the 15th century in fantasy isn't really represented either. Uh, it's much more of a high Middle Ages or Dark Ages. I hate that term, but um, much more of that is represented in your typical fantasy. So, you know, the 1500s, uh, not 1500s, the, uh, fort, late, uh, the 1400s being represented is something I'm actually looking forward to and being able to do in this setting. Uh, there is actually, it was a bit of a hot topic in Soros in like its first week. Um, Gunpowder is, I think, in Soros. It's very, very rare, but it is interesting that it is still a thing restricted mostly to the very rich, but present. And I think that's very interesting. I think we do. Know, so well, that changing time, you know, it's, that, 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 that needs, to, I mean, that is something that, that again, had to be like discussed because if you have a setting where huh, most people are using swords and shields and pikes, and then you have someone who just has like an army full of musketeers, that is potentially a huge imbalance. And so we needed to properly discuss how we wanted to integrate, um, firearms, gunpowder, all that kind of thing. Oh, that kind of stuff. I believe, One ceremonial cannon. One I believe ceremonial cannon. I, th I believe we um. I believe we said something like the Ottoman artillery that you say bring down the walls of Constantinople is like 
the most common thing you could have, and that's only for a very wealthy army and can basically only be used in certain situations. I mean, we're, I, 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 I am all for it if something fits a narrative, being able to use it, but if you are going to be... Um, if you're going to be trying to run around and say, oh, look at me with my army of cannons, that's not a no longer fitting a narrative reason. That is, you know, you trying to say, look out at my shiny new thing and God modding. So I think that's like uh, one of the things we've talked about in um, the Born Masters chats about, you know, what is a narrative, what fills a narrative purpose versus what's God modding. Uh, I also think it's interesting to have gunpowder exist in a world where there's very rampant magic there's a lot of magic and some of it's really really powerful so it's it's interesting to see how that sort of mixes with that late 15th century time period yeah i mean I just going back to the whole for narrative purposes like why things sort of have to fit within that scope of things in order to be considered you know not um sort of overly powerful in a way uh, i know that's the pixel limit for claims right now is 800,000 pixels. And I know that because for my nation, Onsaurus, which is the Krorian Empire, um, I got very close to that. In fact, I intentionally got very close to that. And the reason wasn't because, oh, I just want to have a big nation, big plot of land on this brand new map. It's actually because it fits into the lore of Kroria and its people being these four older kingdoms that join together to form this greater empire. And I can now, like, explore the circumstances under which they join together. But the reason that they have a longer or a larger landmass in this case is because, yeah, there used to be four of them. And they all used to have their own respective lands and uh, sort of, you know, systems within those lands and stuff like that. And different peoples. There's five peoples in Korea. And they all come from those different kingdoms. So, I mean, geographically speaking, it makes sense that it's not like a smaller nation with a smaller claim size. It is a larger nation. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that. Because size doesn't always mean, like, power and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, just making sure that things do fit within a narrative purpose. I think that so far, Ark especially, and the rest of the lore masters have done a good job of, like, helping put that in perspective. To make sure that everyone just has a good time and enjoys it. And unfortunately, I'm, you know, of the, th of the rest of us up here, I feel like I've been the one who's treading that line the finest with, um, you know, having the Dark Lord. Um, I... <laughs> I tell people whenever I want, they want to work with me, I'm like, hey, if you want to use him, he can be as powerful as you want him to. Because I recognize that I need to walk that line, and I don't want to come across as being like, oh, look at me with my immensely powerful being. But if somebody wants him to, you know, be this malevolent dark power that's in their story, I'm, you know, that's the intent of the character. And I think you, uh, a lot of this comes down to when we look at what's in a narrative versus what's god nodding got to look at what is the intent of the story. And, you know, we have a whole bunch of lore masters that are very, very wonderful writers and very um, good at reading between the lines of what people are posting. So I think we're adequately able to look through all that and be like, hey, when somebody makes X, what is X? What is the purpose of X? And does it fit within the wider narrative that, you know, should be accepted in the setting? Uh, it's... It is interesting that you mentioned your nation being large for narrative reasons, and I don't like to talk about myself, but I actually have a very similar reason for why Cinder sells so big, because it is a really big nation, frankly. It, um, it's very close to the claim one. I, I think it's maybe like 50,000 pixels off. It's big. They're all treading the line. I'm treading the line. Exactly. I, I did it because Cinder Sill is a successor state to a very large pre-existing empire, and it is fighting two eternal wars. Um, it kind of makes sense that it'd be an expansionist power that's a lot of that former imperial land. Um, yeah, I, I think having a big nation or a small nation, as long as it's for narrative purposes, is is fantastic. Um, I, I'm actually a huge fan of our northern continent, Andy, uh, Ark, and it's right. fantastic. We have a lot of world building going on in that. We I mean, if we have on truly a horrible place to live, it is. On one side, you have the uh, emperor, the emperor of the dark, um, the king of demons, and all that. And the other side, you have two elven races that are devoted to killing each other. But tell us about this eternal war. No. Two eternal wars, actually. So, um, Tim and I have been sort of world building this eternal war between his nation, the Borean Empire, and my nation, the Kingdom of Cindersil, for. 
I, I would say about as long as I've been in the source uh, team. So about a year or two. Um, the Boreans aren't elves. I'll put that out there. Not elves. Oh my! I don't actually know what they are. <laughs> I'll be real. But they aren't humans and they aren't elves. And it's said in legend that the snow elves and the Boreans have been fighting for eons. For about as long as the snow elves have been on that continent and about as long as the Boreans have existed. Now, there's probably some myth to that in character, in lore, but they have been fighting for a very, very long time. And while it's not really an active back and forth invasion, it's sort of a... It's weird to say, but it's kind of like the Korean border, <laughs> um, where they have skirmishes and they... Well, I guess a really, really hostile version of the Korean border, um, where they have a lot of skirmishes and occasionally large fights, but they're not really a shifting front line between them. Um, so the Boreans and Sinjur still have been fighting for a very, very long time. Uh, I would imagine even before Sinjur still was united, they were fighting. Um, and the other eternal wars with Yolk's people, and there isn't a ton of world building behind it yet because it's fairly recent, but they have also been fighting pretty much non-stop with Sindrasil since Sindrasil was a united nation and since the Gelbin Bomb were a united force. Uh, so Sindrasil is fighting two eternal wars on two fronts and it's having a very bad time, but it's it's surviving. That's about the best they can do. I mean, if you're fighting an eternal war, you're probably not having a great time, are you? So it kind of adds up. No, and... I suppose the main reason they were able to survive this long is because of the way their government is organized. I organize it into a triumvirate. You have three big portions of the government. You have the Lucent Church, which is sort of like the Catholic Church, I guess, except it's not, you know, Christianity. It's very large. It's very all and Tell us about Snow Elf Jesus. <laughs> no. <laughs> there is no singular Snow Elf Jesus. Uh, the Snow Elves, or the Acelomer, if you want to call them by their proper name. No, I don't. Uh, uh, they believe in three deities. Three main deities. You have Alana, you have Nero, not to be confused with the Roman Emperor Nero, and you have a third one who I forgot the name of because I worked about them like a couple days ago. Um, <laughs> but you have three main deities. Iwata is the deity of the uh, moon. She's a moon goddess. She's also a sort of, the snow elf. she's sort of just some mischievous kind of person, you know, she does like harmless pranks, but to everyone else, she's a literal trickster goddess. Um, there's Nero, who is their sun god and their chief deity of war. And then there's a third one who is sort of this in-between figure. They are both young and old, they're both a child of those two other deities and completely separate from them. They are a god of twilight. Uh, I don't have much written about them yet. Um, but the Lama and Nero are very, very important aspects of the average Snow Elves' lives. Um, religion is a very important aspect of their lives in general. You are probably expected to worship daily. Maybe not fanatically, but you know, at least go to go to Snow Elf Church. Give the Snow Elf donations? Yeah, give some donations to the Lucent Church. Um, the Snow Elf, Elf Church. The Lucent Church, which is a sort of actual religious group, um, they sort of wormed their way into Snow Elf and society. I mentioned earlier that there was a dragon cult before the Snow Elves were around. That was made up of both Snow Elves and Possibly some humans, uh, but eventually, uh, some of the higher ups and the military of that cult get a little bit sick of shit. Apologies, uh, using my one swear word. Um, they get a little bit sick of it and they rebel. And a big part of that are these then cultists who eventually form the Lucid Church. So at the time of the rebellion, they were cultists and they were kind of outcasts, but because they're so essential to the war effort in destroying this dragon cult, they become really, really important and they gain a lot of political power and their religion gets a lot of traction. Uh, so that's how that all happened. And that's why they now worship Ilana and Nero and the Listen Church. 
Very good world building. Meanwhile, uh, I have really nothing for the Archeans beyond ancestor worship and uh, Sauroth sometimes. All the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and I, I will apologize because I, I think my world building gets a little disorganized because I've been a little bit, uh, shall we say, silly, and I haven't written anything about uh, forms yet. Um, so I apologize my world building is a little bit disorganized because I'm kind of pulling from my previous Discord post instead of a, a document or something like that. I'll and, uh, do that too. I'll say like in Discord and like the Saurus world building channel, I'll be like, yeah, in Gruria we have X, Y, Z. And then I just haven't as of yet put it on the forums. I just kind of have like a template going on for my world building thread so far. And it's like, I'm going to fill in the blanks on the forums when it comes to it. But like in, in my head, it's like, yeah, this stuff exists, but have I put it out there into like the world of Saurus yet? Not quite. And I think we're really missing one of the best pieces of world building in uh, Saurus. And unfortunately, Adam just left. It's uh, Dougie, the uh, weapons inspector. I, uh, yeah. The wonderful wizard of Oon. The wonderful wizard of Oon. I don't remember how that came into being, what exactly prompts uh, the uh, uh, Dougie coming to being, but um, we were sitting in voice chat, and somebody made some comment about, I think it was um, uh, f uh, weapons, like... Uh, was it, not weapons. Uh, what is, somebody wanted to do a fantasy Geneva convention. Right, and which is kind of ridiculous when you consider the way that medieval people viewed warfare. Um, nobody was ever going to sign up for anything like that. But um, the idea kind of created this joke where M said, like, try give me one island, give me like one small island and I will create a wizard who's, who just goes around like enforcing the UN style bureaucracy throughout Saurus. And uh, I was like, I'll give you an island and I'll call it the you know, like UN. Um, so... That was how that uh, happened. I'm, uh, and I'm quite happy that it did because uh, it's quite possibly one of my favorite bits of RP. So, like, yeah, there, yeah if we have uh, Dougie going up to Salroth, the Dark Lord, and one of his uh, torture demons, and um, telling him how they need to get their tickets uh, for their torture pit re renewed, and I, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I think um, Em and I were in voice chat one time when I was driving home from work. Um, and he, uh, and him and I were just talking back and forth. He was saying, uh, say he would talk in a really thick Australian accent. Cause we imagine Dougie having a really thick Australian accent and I would do a dark Lord voice, which I will not do ever because I'd cringe, but, uh, him and I just talked for like an hour and he's like, okay, I've written this all down and I will be posting it by the end of today. <laughs> And it's gotten, like, a lot of positive feedback. Like, people have been saying, like, oh, I want Dougie to visit, like, my nation next, which is, it, it's it's just great. So, uh, yeah, Doug, Dougie's awesome. I love Dougie. I'd love to have to visit the Sandra Phillips at some point. The story of Saurus, I've learned all the adventures of Dougie. Look, look, I mean, he's kind of a Tom Bombadil character in that it's the implication is that he's probably the most powerful and ancient being in Saurus. Like, he probably predates every civilization and race in Saurus and is immensely powerful, but he's just completely neutral. He gives no shits about the moral alignment of anybody. He doesn't care if you wage, like, a genocidal campaign against your neighbors or anything. He just wants to make sure that, you know, the legislation is upheld. Um, I think, um... <laughs> Him and, I, him and I were just world building a voice chat, and um, we have it that Dougie and his buddy Steve, who's an asshole who's on a boat, apparently, um, and they have a boss, Sheila, who uh, went on a date with Sal Ross uh, like 10, 10 million years ago or wherever we're having that be. And so the, the, Dougie, the Dougie lore runs deep at this point. Absolutely. 
this is your monthly reminder to renew your siege permit. So you gotta get those renewed every 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 five years. Uh, if you, if those expire, you have to pay a pretty hefty fine every time you besiege a city. Uh, you'll probably have to be giving away a bunch of those spoils you just won, so you don't want to do that. Oh no, Dougie is gonna have a field day when he realizes that the Korean border fortifications to the freeholds aren't up to code. I bet they don't have a single rail yana. Huh? No, not a single railing going over the battlements. <laughs> How terrible. <laughs> this is truly bad. Uh, what if you fall and break your neck? That's, that's, uh, that's, he's also the OSHA. Um, he's also the OSHA wizard. He, he makes sure that all the working conditions are up to standards. Well, you know, M's M returned for this. Yeah, M, M returns, right? We're fitted, wrapping up Dougie, unfortunately. I just, I just assume that someone like tipped off M and is like, hey, we're talking about Dougie. You want to show up? But yeah, um, I'm also I'm very excited about what we're doing with uh what when I say we you know uh Steve Ark myself MJ to to a degree I'm trying to pull him in a little bit uh we'll see where where the head goes but um just this you know this this uh girl in the sun story where uh Saroth is moving against the thirteen realms and there's one um. Uh, Archean girl who's being sent to kill a Joan of Arc type character. So that'll be very interesting. And one thing I'm really enjoying about that is um, Arc and I, um, we've been in DMs the last few days talking about uh, planning some stuff out because I very much take uh, Salroth as a Lucifer character. Um, and I mean that as in the current Christian interpretation of Lucifer and Satan being a similar being. Because I don't know that much about the whole, I don't know much that much about it, but I'm trying my best through uh, reading about it. Um, I'm trying to make him a lord of temptation, a someone who's going to uh, tempt these lords all over the thirteen realms and all over the world to, you know, sell their soul to him or do something to him, so he can make the invasion easier. I don't want it to be a uh, him to be a villain who's all just about, you know, demonic conquest. I want it to be something where he sends. A, uh, a specific demon that can fulfill the vice of a lord or something. Uh, that being said, I'm sure he does enjoy a little bit of uh, skull smashing. Now, a little, a little bit, of, a little bit of conquest every once in a while. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, sort of refocusing the discussion as far as just source in particular compared to the other RP settings. A lot of what um, is being talked about here, like you would not find that anywhere close to any of the other RP settings. I know there's an AS, which is like, you know, space, sort of fa future fantasy tech in a way. Um, Air is obviously modern tech, strange, real, same thing. It's first tech level. Um, but really, what Soros does is, yeah, you get the freedom to come up with this, that even in the late, you know, the 15th century, in which you have all these other things going on in a period that, as we talked about, is a bit underrated in history, you still have characters like Ducky who come around <laughs> and y you can get that because people have come together and created it. So I think that's one of the really cool things about Zorus that um, <laughs> you're not going to find it anywhere else. So even if you're just like, hey, I'm a fantasy buff and you want to do something that's related to fantasy, sometimes it can like extend out to other things. Oh, yeah, really. And, um, you know, the other thing about Zorus is that if you want to ignore those like super high fantasy elements, you can do that. Perfectly welcome to it. You could also go as silly as you want. Um, Soros has a lot of creative freedom in all of our settings too, but I think Soros especially has probably the most creative freedom of any of the settings. I mean, we have people tell I mean, we have people going through all of the um uh we you look at all the races that people have made. I mean, there's um I think it's supple that has made a kingdom that's a combination of um, like bunny people and all that kind of stuff. And then Mad Jack has, um, turtle people, frog people, a whole bunch, a whole mess of other things. It, it, you know, you have these people who just come up with these really creative ways to take stuff that you would recognize from this world and somehow make it fantasy. I think Mad Jack has, a, uh, his seems like a rather, uh, it's a caste based society, if I remember correctly. There's a cast of, um, warriors who are these, um, I believe it's the Egyptian jackal statues that he just extrapolated into a fantasy setting and made them an actual species which i thought was very interesting i mean i'm just really i love how people take their creativity and just run with it in the fantasy setting rather than being bogged down by 
I mean, you know, real life in the groups. Or even like just, you know, having the ability to look into magic versus, you know, eras, which era is a setting I love, but I took I took this setting as a way to get out of my typical, you know, trying to, you know, do Roman stuff as I, you know, ancient historian right here, but um I took this away to break a break from my mold a little bit and I've been really enjoying it. On magic, like on the topic of magic especially, was a bit of a if I if I recall the dis- the early discussions correctly, it was a bit of a tough spot because we weren't entirely sure. Like, hey, should we have a set universal magic system or should we let people do as they please? Uh, we did ultimately settle on uh, sticking with that true north of creative creative liberties for role players. Uh, you can, within the bounds of reason and within staying outside of the realm of god modding, you can basically have your own magic system. Do you want something that's more like elemental bending, like you see in Avatar or something? Do you want something that's akin more to what you see in Tolkien's works? Or do you want something that's more like uh, the Elder Scrolls and how they handle magic? Like, it's up to you. Absolutely. And also, you can um, obviously have, like, magical dynamics within your civilization. Uh, Using my own nation, again, as an example, um, we have, obviously, like I talked about before earlier, the, the five peoples, but of those five peoples, not every single one of them can use magic. I mean, even in a fantasy setting, there are creatures who don't use magic, per se, and there are obviously going to be species who have a higher proficiency of being able to use magic of certain kinds and certain techniques and stuff like that. So with that, creative freedom is obviously definitely something that people can explore um, individually, but also like collaboratively, like with any other thing. Because if you're RPing like a conflict between two civilizations, how how is magic going to impact, you know, the warfare kind of element of that, the stories being told? Um, you know, as far as even treat even treating things like illnesses for characters, you know, can can your is healing magic, you know, something that you wanted to explore. Magic is a very versatile thing, but um as far as the dynamics of who can practice it, to what extent are they proficient at it, etc. Um, those are also questions that individual RPers can explore on source. I remember, oh, yeah. um, I remember Pred uh, was joking with us one time that he was taking to take his Aeneas nation and put it in uh, Soros because, um, um, what is it, um, science at some point become, becomes indiscernible from magic. Technology, technology that is sufficiently advanced becomes indiscernible for magic. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, you know, when you were saying that, I just made me think of that. Like, if he did do that, at to some degree, he would, you know, be allowed to, but he'd have to change things to certain uh, at some at some point. But I do think it's interesting how you can work within the setting of fantasy to, you know, even take technology to some degree as a way of being magic. I remember one of my first ideas for. Soros was actually I was going to do a empire that was devoted to hunting down wizards and other magical beings, and seeing them as a as a blight against um, the divine creation. I obviously stepped away from that, but you know that ability to have stuff like that as a um, as a counter to just doing pure magic, I think, is one of the benefits of uh, the setting. Like you can go. Um, numerous different amount of ways to get to the same point. Yeah, and one of the questions I pose to myself as far as magic is concerned is, you know, would it be reasonable, this is something I discussed with other source peers, is would it be reasonable to, you know, have traditional, not traditional, but like, you know, typical technology as far as weaponry and stuff like that, but have them be amplified or magically charred in a way that it, obviously erring on the side of not making them overpowered, but making them more effective as weapons. Just these, you know, conventional weapons, but with an element of magic incorporated to make them something either more powerful or mysterious to, to make give it, you know, multiple dimensions to it in a way. And as it came out, you know, people were just like, yeah, absolutely, you can do that as long as you don't, like, make it extremely powerful and just, like, one weapon takes down an entire army, which I wasn't going to do, but... That's that's something else. Even the technology level, magic touches that too if your civilization has magic. If I was going to have, you know, pikemen or something like that, uh, pikemen's a bit more middle-aged, but 
pikemen, uh, perhaps their pikes have some some sort of you know magical charm or element to them, and that that's something that I could create if I wanted to you know flesh that out more. Yeah, well, absolutely. I I especially I hope to see how it interacts with the time period that we sort of based stars off, uh, because there were a lot of technological changes going on in that period. And of course, Source doesn't reflect all of them, but I think it'd be really neat to see how magic interacts with, say, gunpowder or new um, navigational technology um, and all that sort of stuff. I think it'd be very interesting to see that, and I hope we do see it eventually. Absolutely. I think that'll be very fun to play with with the uh, Archeans, especially, because they don't really necessarily... I mean, they can manifest elemental magic, so like guns would probably never even occur to them so it's gonna be very interesting to see how they react when they come across guns i by the way i didn't mention i really like the archers they're they are hunter gatherers on a continent of quite organized states relatively speaking yes yes they are uh the way that i kind of view it is that they are like basically saroff kind of keeps them as they are, more or less. You don't upset the peasants too much, otherwise they try to overthrow. It. <laughs> but if you need, if you need your if you need your tips on evil villaining, I gotcha. Most damn peasants, why can't they just starve and leave me alone? Yeah, so I mean, we talked about the process as far as the the concept, people getting involved, be, people being pulled into things, how the map kind of sets up the setting and gives people the freedom to create what they want just the general idea of having the freedom more so than other settings, some more of the out there stories that Source has already produced, a little bit referencing each of our nations, kind of the culmination of how people bring stuff together, and also the subject of magic. Is there any other subject that you guys wanted to touch or anything else that you particularly wanted to uh, bring up? Nothing specifically, just uh, wanted to say that, you know, I think that uh, I continue to really be proud of the RP community that we have here, and uh, I think Soros is another great outlet for that. So if anybody is listening who is involved in RP, wants to give fantasy a try, uh, welcome. And uh, if you're not into RP necessarily, but you still want to give fantasy a try, uh, come on by. Uh, I think you're going to find we're very welcoming. So... Uh, just, I guess this is my hard sell for Saurus. Uh, give it a, give it a try. I don't think you're going to regret it. Yeah, we got a Dark Lord. I mean, oh. I would sign on to the endorsement too, because even though I've been on, um, I've been around TNP for quite a number of years now, but even just like my various forays into RP, every single time people are always very helpful, willing to answer questions, very welcoming, um, things like that, able to give you like perspective. There's nothing wrong with approaching them. Hey, can you help me out with this? Hey, how does this sound? You know, everybody, everybody is just uh, very imaginative, very creative, but also just like very uh, willing to kind of, you know, give you that help so that everyone can have a good time. So yeah, if you're interested in fantasy, that's absolutely something you should check out. Taurus is great. That's why I'm there. I thought it was cool and I wanted to check it out. So I'm there. Um, and yeah, this is a great kind of, intro to the world of what you might be able to explore creatively if you join source indeed indeed all right that's going to be it for our nbs uh show on the world of source everyone if you'd like to give a you know sort of shouting off there uh thank you so much for having us this was really really cool um please join source we'd love to have you if you're interested at all fantasy or rp or even if you just want to check it out for a little bit, we'd still be happy to have you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us, and uh, anyone who wants to come by, uh, please feel free. Um, and uh, it's great to be doing RP stuff again on NBS. Uh, yeah, like, absolutely. Uh, if you've got, even if you haven't, like, really dipped your toes into RP before, uh, if you've really got that fantasy itch, you're you're looking to scratch. Like source source's doors are wide open, and like Andy and Prev said, we'd love to have you. I'd love to have you, um, especially. Um, like if 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 it if it's if fantasy, if like medieval fantasy and all this and all that, like really get to you, like really, uh, it's really something you want to do. 
Source's doors are wide open. Uh, we'd love to have you. Absolutely. And uh, I hope you all come by, but uh, long live Salroth. Indeed. Long live Salroth. It's not Nord. All right. Thank you to both our live audience and attendants and to anyone possibly listening on YouTube at a later time once it's uploaded. This has been NBS Radio, signing off.